Fallout, the little brother of Elder Scrolls, yet still one of the most beloved franchises in all of gaming. But what if I told you that a series based on the eradication of the entire human race was hiding even more demented, horrifying, and crazy secrets? Safe conditions under which such a bank of fashionable material can be made essentially immune to surprise seizure. He says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. War. War never changes. Let's go back. For those that don't know, an iceberg is a look into the strangest and most disturbing ideas in our favorite worlds. The ideas that make us wonder, the ideas that make us squirm, and the ideas that light the fire within our soul to know about what's out there. And you see, my iceberg lists are a little different. I'm not going to just go down a pre-made list and look at each and every theory, but instead I have my own curated one. That includes theories, interesting lore, and just cool quests that I like in each of the games. If you've ever played or even heard of Fallout, you probably immediately recognize this symbol of the vault boy with a cherry smile on his face and a thumbs up. What on the surface looks like just a happy advertisement for vault tech though, may be hiding a much more sinister undertone. Almost a decade ago, a Reddit thread was made that postulated that the vault boy in this picture isn't actually happy, but instead putting his thumbs up to check for a nuclear blast. You see, in this Reddit thread, it is claimed that the US government back during the Cold War era would suggest citizens in the event of a nuclear blast put their thumbs up in front of themselves and squint one eye, and if their thumb covered the entire blast, then they were far enough away to be safe from radiation. So it looks like that's what's happening with the Vault Boy, right? Well, maybe not so much. You see, this theory is one of the most popular in all of Fallout, but as pointed out by YouTuber father Eli Jackal, this is most likely not the case. Brian Fargo, one of the original creators of Fallout, and T. Ray Isaac, the man behind the Vault Boy design, have both independently confirmed on Twitter that the symbol is just meant to be a happy Vault Boy used for propaganda for Vault Tech. And not just this, but even with a small amount of research, it becomes obvious that this thumb idea is false. During the Cold War, the US government advocated duck and cover, not sticking your thumb in the air. But ironically, neither of these would help you very much if nukes actually started dropping. Either way though, one of the most beloved theories in all of Fallout is most likely nothing but a scam thousands of Redditors fell for years ago. Who would have guessed? One of the most common animals you can find in Fallout 4 and 76, well, at least common for animals that aren't trying to kill you that is, is cats. This doesn't sound weird on the surface, but it gets a lot more interesting when you realize that there are literally zero, not even one cat in any other Fallout games or spin-offs. You see, cats in the Fallout universe, at least as proposed by Mr. House in New Vegas, went extinct after the bombs fell. So how are there suddenly so many in recent times? One theory postulated that there may have actually been a cat vault. Shortly before the player in Fallout 4 exits their vault, the cats were released from their own hidden metropolis to repopulate the world with the objectively worse version of a dog. The problem with this though is that we also see tons of cats in Fallout 76, and that game takes place only 25 years after the Great War, when all the bombs originally fell. Still though, maybe there were multiple cat vaults, and some even crazier theories suggest that some of the vault tech vaults may have experimented on the cats by ghoulifying them, something we'll touch more on later in this series. Regardless of the real story though, something behind the scenes is happening with cats in the Fallout universe, and there has to be a reason these pesky felines are causing so much drama. 
One of my personal favorite vaults in the entire Fallout franchise is Vault 108, affectionately known as the Gary Vault. Located in the wilderness of Fallout 3 lies a mysterious door hidden behind a large rock formation. When you first enter, you find a dead body on the ground, and even more interestingly, a vault door left completely wide open. As you step inside, you are met with a scene of horror. Blood marks cover the walls, furniture is thrown around, and the generators powering the vault are completely offline. You find dead wastelander bodies of those trying to loot the facility all over. But the true horror comes when you find the body labeled Gary42, after just being attacked by an extremely similar looking person named Gary33. As you make your way deeper into the vault, you slowly uncover that it is littered with an army of clones of this one man, Gary, all hilariously shouting at you the entire time. <laughs> Gary. And if you have the courage to go even deeper into this twisted vault, you eventually uncover that a scientist was performing experiments of cloning and even find a sectioned off female dorm blocked by tons of cabinets, suggesting that at one point they had barricaded themselves inside, presumably to protect themselves from men who can't stop shouting their name. The true intrigue though comes if you go to the Pentagon in Fallout 3, because it's here we can open top secret terminal information on multiple vaults, including Vault 108. The vault was originally set to perform experiments in cloning over a span of 30 years, but the generators were only spec'd for 20. We can find multiple reports of complaints from the vault residents, but all were shot down by the vault tech higher ups. On top of this, the original overseer, which for those of you who don't know is essentially the leader of any vault, was known to have cancer, and we can find discussions estimating his death after three years followed up by a journal entry stating, these two events should combine to allow a proper catalyst that allows this project to continue as planned. So something was going on in this vault that most people living there weren't aware of, and it leads us to even more questions than it answers. What were these cloning experiments for? How did so many clones survive for so long? Were the experiments to find immortality? And why are there female dorms but no male dorms? Could it be as YouTuber Oxhorn postulates that the true experiment of the vault was putting a large group of females all with one cloned male to see what happens? Either way, it's clear that at some point the Gary clones started to become more and more aggressive, and with time eventually overtook the vault, which coincidentally we see in the Pentagon logs stocked with three times the normal amount of munitions. So maybe when the generators turned off, the Garys all grabbed the guns and started screaming Gary while massacring the entire vault and its inhabitants. A horrifying idea to think about. Another little known fact that many Fallout fans might not know about Fallout 4, which takes place in Boston, was that actually at one point it was supposed to take place in New York instead, what many players consider to be the holy grail for a Fallout location. Emil previously a lead writer at Bethesda and now the lead designer on Starfield, spoke to Noclip in a documentary and briefly mentioned that at one point Fallout 4 had a short design document that had the game taking place in New York, with the only similarity being Nick Valentine being involved. We hear about New York multiple times throughout the Fallout franchise, and while it is one of the first places that the bombs dropped, we also know some Brotherhood of Steel members have traveled through the area and seen mutants in skyscrapers, so there is still life. On top of this, the verticality and political intrigue from Fallout lore make this a perfect location for a future game. Being close to the Niagara Falls and Canada to the north would set the stage for some non-urban environments as well. And in the Fallout lore, Canada is annexed by the United States in the Resource Wars, so political intrigue would be abound. There's a reason every Fallout player wants to see the universe's take on New York. And while Fallout 4's iteration was likely scrapped due to budget and tech constraints, Fallout 5 has a very good chance of making this dream a reality. Everyone's favorite canine companion from Fallout 4, Dogmeat, is a super lovable character. He helps you find loot, 
he bites every enemy in your path, and most importantly, he's a good boy. But some Fallout fans have started to wonder if Dogmeat is even a real dog. You see, originally we find him outside the Red Rocket gas station at the very start of the game. And the fact that he is so well trained and immediately obedient and takes a liking to you is very weird. And as you play through more of the game, you start to notice more interesting oddities, like the fact that he takes no radiation damage. Almost every other animal in the game has become mutated from radiation poisoning, and other dogs that we meet in the game, like Rex, are, well, different. But Dogmeat seems to be an excellent fighter, perfectly trained, immune to radiation and plasma gunfire, and also one of the only dogs in the whole game that looks this pristine. Could it be that Dogmeat was actually sent from the Institute to guide you on your path to a secret hidden location? Maybe Dogmeat is actually a synth robot posing as man's best friend all in a ploy to bring you to Sean at the Institute. But even if he is a conniving robot, he's still the cutest companion in all of Fallout. Scattered all across the wasteland in Fallout 4 are fluffy little teddy bears, all in different interesting and sometimes comical positions. It's an obvious way for Bethesda to have some fun environmental storytelling with the players, but what if these cute and cuddly little stuffed animals had a lot more to hide? We know that throughout playing Fallout 4, sometimes you are being watched by certain characters and entities working for the Institute. But what if the biggest one of these was actually right under our nose the whole time? Many of these teddy bears in the world are in very high value locations, often off to the side, simply staring into the abyss. But what if these bears were actually cameras set up by the Institute to track not only you, but all the activity in the wasteland? It would perfectly fit the character of the organization, and also adds an extremely creepy undertone every time you go into a new building and see one of these guys, now wondering if you are constantly being watched. At one point in your journey in Fallout 4, you may have stumbled upon these caravan guards at Bunker Hill. They're having a conversation about a supposed creature they have seen and heard of off the Boston mainline harbor. Referred to as a ghoul whale by the guards, this creature is apparently a massive and horrendous monster that has been obliterated by radiation. It stalks the waters at night and hunts its prey killing anything in its path, and strikes fear into every single seafaring creature. But if you actually go to the Boston Harbor in-game, you can't find anything even remotely similar to this description, with the only plausible thing being that the guards mistook a local submarine for some sort of monstrosity. However, if we go into the Fallout 4 game files, we can find assets for this supposed ghoul whale, and well, it's terrifying. In fact, in the Far Harbor DLC that was released for the game over a year after its initial release, we can see giant whale skeletons littering the coast of Far Harbor, suggesting that this creature is in fact not a myth. The truth is the ghoul whale was likely cut out at some point in the development, and this is why we can never actually find it in game. But based on multiple lines of dialogue and the actual game files themselves, it's quite obvious that at some point, Bethesda intended on having this colossus play a major part in some underwater adventure. And speaking of underwater adventures, another interesting piece of cut content from Fallout 4 is the quest 20 Leagues Under the Sea. The quest is a play on the words referencing a book and movie series 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, which would likely have the same premise where the hero travels deep underwater to fight and slay a giant and mysterious squid monster. In fact, in the cut game files, we can even see an animation for this quest, which includes our favorite big whale buddy, the ghoul whale, swimming around in the background. But if we dig even more into this mystery, we start to find a lot of other peculiar references. Located at the bottom of the sea near Boston Harbor are many unused and weird buildings and assets that we never actually see in the main game. And on top of this, we can find even more weird unused assets in the game files, like textures for a giant squid, underwater vault door mesh and scaffolding, and even a fully functional and awesome harpoon gun. 
Even more damning though, at one point in Fallout's main story, Deacon can remark about a fantastical and crazy underwater city full of adventure, implying that he has been there before. So when putting all of this evidence together, it becomes quite clear that at some point in the development of Fallout 4, there were big plans for a massive underwater vault akin to the Bioshock series, where we could have peered into the deep blue ocean from inside the vault and battled creatures like the ghoul whale and giant squids, all with new weapons and assets. It's sad that this idea never saw the day of light because truly it would have been one of, if not the most interesting vault in the entire Fallout series, and shows just how much potential the world of Fallout has to create amazing and unique ideas. And by the way, for those of you wondering and who are particularly interested in this idea, there's actually some mods you can download that will recreate this Vault 120 and give you access to a new player home underwater where you can experience at least some of what Bethesda had planned. Some of the coolest and most interesting quests in all of Fallout come from the earlier entries in the series, and for that reason remain largely unknown and not talked about today. But a personal favorite of mine from these is the Ghost Farm from Fallout 2. At one point in your journey, you can stumble upon a farm referred to as the Ghost Farm from locals nearby due to apparently supernatural sightings in the area. And if you make your way to the farm, you are immediately greeted with a horrific scene. Dozens of bodies are impaled, lining the farmland with blood everywhere. But upon closer inspection, it becomes clear to the player that these bodies are nothing but scarecrows with Brahmin blood smeared on them. If you make your way to the center of the farm, you find an army of ghosts, as well as a lot of high-level guards, who if you surrender to, take you down to a secret underground city beneath the farm. It's here you learn that the people of this farm have actually lived underground now for years, and have trouble even dealing with sunlight hence why no other nearby towns know of their presence, as the underground dwellers only come out at night to tend to the farm and hide underground during the day. You learn that the ghosts are nothing but dressed up guards and that the reason these underground peoples have done this is to protect their farmland from intruders who are scared of coming based on its haunted origins. Deep in their underground city, you are also able to find a room full of missing children from a nearby town called Modak, which coincidentally the leader of the underground peoples wants you to deliver a message to. The quest has a ton of different possibilities and outcomes, including telling the people of Modak about the lost children, who in turn storm the underground lair and it results in everyone dying and dooming both civilizations, as well as ways to save both towns and make everybody happy. One of the most interesting things, though, is that some of the sound effects in the lair beneath the farm are eerily similar to some sound effects we hear from the Deep Ones from Elder Scrolls Oblivion, another theory I spoke about on my Elder Scrolls iceberg. Could it be that these ghost farm people are actually in talks with the same demented and evil beings known as the Deep Ones from the Elder Scrolls? Considering I made this theory up after hearing two vaguely similar sounding sound effects from the two games made by separate studios, probably not, but don't ruin this for me. Either way, this underground city has one of the coolest twists in the entire Fallout series. Anyone who has played Fallout 4 has become accustomed to seeing these buzzkills. Strung all throughout the world, the Fallout 4 mannequins have a very strange and creepy feeling to them. Often you will find them in the corners of rooms in weird, almost human-like positions. And sometimes enemy synths will even try to disguise and blend in with the mannequins, making every time you encounter some especially anxiety-inducing. However, the most horrifying moment with the mannequins actually occurs in the Far Harbor DLC, where the player can find a sunken boat off the coast, and inside an army of mannequins. Even more than usual, these mannequins are in very peculiar and lifelike poses, with some staring out of the windows and others seemingly talking amongst each other. The worst offender of them, though, is a specific mannequin that can be found holding a machete over the dead body of one of the crew members. And nearby this perplexing scene, we find a note that states, I can't wait to drop these damn mannequins off. The crew is starting to claim that they are hearing weird noises from the cargo. Maybe they are playing pranks on me? Whatever, we are almost there. 
This entire shipwreck heavily implies that the mannequins of Fallout 4 are in fact more than meets the eye. And some theories even argue that the mannequins may be controlled by the Cthulian deity Uglathoth. I butchered that. <laughs> the evil being worshipped by the Dunwich peoples. Something we will talk about much later on this list. A couple years ago, Pete Hines from Bethesda came out and made a statement about some theories that Fallout and Elder Scrolls take place in the same universe. And he said, I haven't the foggiest of notion how anyone could make the leap that they are in fact part of the same thing. We made Elder Scrolls, and a completely different developer and publisher came up with Fallout, which we then acquired. No, I don't think there's any universe in which those universes are in the same universe. That's not a thing. Now, for most sane people, they would stop here and realize that this theory makes no sense. But luckily for you guys, that guy isn't me. The reason some have begun to believe Fallout and Elder Scrolls are in the same universe, though, comes down to some key findings. For example, in Fallout 4, we can find a Taboo Tattoos magazine, which on the cover has a skeleton with a very familiar looking helmet, the one the Dragonborn dons in Skyrim. On top of this, in the Fallout 4 Nuka World DLC, players can find a giant bear statue that looks exactly like the bears from Skyrim. Checkmate, Pete. But most interestingly of all, in Pridwin, during Fallout 4, if the player enters the Scientist and Botany Quarter, they can find a very familiar looking plant called the Experimental Plant, an item that looks eerily close to Nern Roots in Elder Scrolls. This plant in Fallout also has all the same properties of Nern Roots, growing near water, healing the player, and its lovable bioluminescent glow. So could it be that after the bombs dropped in Fallout and radiation took over and destroyed the planet, that millions of years later this radiation slowly transforms the world and wildlife of Earth into the planet of Nern, where the Elder Scrolls takes place? Maybe this is where the magic from Elder Scrolls comes from, the splitting of atomic bonds that cast our Earth into a nuclear winter, forever changing our destiny. This is complicated somewhat by the fact that Nern in Elder Scrolls has two moons while Earth only has one. But maybe in that million years, cosmic forces started to take over. Maybe like the Dunwich deity from Fallout, becoming the Daedra from Elder Scrolls. Another possibility is that a satellite sent from Earth during the Great Wars could have crash landed on some faraway planet, that being Nern, and that's how they relate. Either way, I can't wait for people to come up with some more random BS when Starfield comes out, for how that's connected to. In the Fallout universe, one of the most horrific things that can happen to a human being is called ghoulification. After the bombs fell and the entire world was covered in nuclear radiation, many people started to succumb to this horror. Some people are turned into a naked mole-rat-human hybrid that still retains full consciousness and ability for speech and communication, while others are transformed into what we know as feral ghouls, which act much more like rabid animals who want nothing but to kill. Throughout the games, we meet many of each type of these ghouls who have undergone ghoulification, but we never truly get an explanation as to what exactly is happening. For example, there's a small shack in Fallout New Vegas where we can find a man who is trying to turn himself into a ghoul to study the effects of this ghoulification, but in the process simply died from radiation poisoning. So why is it that some people die from the nuclear fallout, while others turn into ghouls with all their mental capacity still there, and even furthermore, then some people turn into nothing but rabid, huskless killers? The best guess we have so far is that there's some sort of gene that some humans in the Fallout franchise have that results in them turning into ghouls when exposed to radiation, while others simply are killed from its side effects. Some believe that all ghouls eventually turn feral and aggressive, while others think that even feral ghouls can be brought back. It spawns an interesting discussion into what ghouls really are, and whether they are truly still human or not as well as what exactly is causing this process to occur. For a company so prevalent across the wasteland and in all Fallout games, you would think that we'd have a better idea about Vault-Tec's real motives by now. But the truth is, it's hard to say. 
You see, vault -Tec was originally founded as a semi-private enterprise that was given trillions of dollars by the US government to construct vaults that would house and protect the people in the event that the bombs did drop. As we know from the games though, many of these vaults were actually created in order to spawn weird and twisted experiments, to test things like radiation poisoning and what would happen if you gave a large group of people no food and no way to escape. Would they resort to cannibalism? But why was vault -Tec even interested in doing these heinous experiments? What benefit would it be to them? Especially if the entire world would have been bombed to oblivion anyways. This is where it gets super interesting. In the original cancelled Fallout 3 Van Buren project, the creator of the vault themselves, Tim Kaine, explained in the original script they were set to have the Enclave looking to find and populate a new planet other than Earth. For those that don't know, the Enclave is a secret group of high-ranking military and political officials that before the bombs dropped, knowing the inevitability of everyone's demise, formed an almost Illuminati-like group of powerful people with their own unknown goals to protect themselves from future Armageddon. This idea about finding a new planet to live on is especially interesting though when we start to dig a little deeper. You see, in Fallout 3, one of the most famous moments in the game is discovering a giant armed nuclear bomb in the middle of a city, and famously players can decide to disarm it and save dozens of lives, or instead opt to detonate it, wiping the small town off the map. But for especially astute players, they may have noticed something very, very strange. If you go up to the bomb in Megaton, you would expect to see a Chinese flag or emblem, as they are the main adversary who bombed the US. But instead we see... vault -Tec? We know from terminal entries in the Pentagon in Fallout 3 as well that the United States counter-launched nukes only after they had indication that birds were in the sky. But they only assumed it was China. There was no actual confirmation anywhere that China actually fired the first nuke. Could it be that vault -Tec were the ones who actually launched the first nuke? Considering the cancelled Fallout movie from Interplay had a similar plotline, it certainly was the plan at one point. But why would they do this, you ask? Well, potentially to force people into the vaults they had created in order to perform research. But then naturally the question becomes, to what end was all this research they were doing for? We may get a hint of the answer in the newest entry of Fallout. Fallout 76. You see, in-game we can find a university that was bought out by vault -Tec before the bombs dropped, and when it was bought, almost all of the staff were immediately laid off, leaving only high-value engineers and scientists in place. The only other two staff that were kept were two linguists, specifically linguists who were studying the Horse Creek petroglyphs, a real set of weird markings on stones in our real life. Some Reddit and Discord users were able to datamine these glyphs and found that in-game some of the markings can be deciphered and translated to say, Prepare yourself for the destruction of your life by fire when you arrive. Life weakens. Protect what remains of Earth. Is vault -Tec's ultimate goal to conquer the stars and make contact with aliens and helping them to do so? all while performing crazy experiments on helpless civilians in order to advance technology towards this goal? We may never know the answer, but I really hope if we don't get a new Fallout anytime soon, Starfield could potentially show us a future remnants of vault -Tec on different planets, even if just as an easter egg. The new plague is only briefly mentioned in parts of each of the Fallout games but is potentially one of, if not the biggest threats to the entire world. Before the Great War that resulted in the fallout we know today, there were many conflicts going on throughout the world, primarily between the United States and China. And as we travel through each fallout game, we can find many settlements and journal entries dating back to this period in history. But the most interesting documents we can find on this entire period are references to a mysterious contagion called the New Plague. In the Fallout 3 Point Lookout DLC, for example, we can stumble upon an old American army camp, where if we check the terminals, we can see that the camp was riddled with cases of this so-called new plague. Victims were showing symptoms of profuse sweating, unexplained contusions or swelling, massive external hemorrhaging, and most terrifying of all, new ideas like socialism. In Fallout 4, we have had some small moments where we can hear the characters talk about how they have gotten a new and strange illness with extremely similar symptoms, 
And in Fallout 1, we even meet a self-aware supercomputer named Zack 1.2, who mentions that the company behind the power suit armors we wear in games was also trying to cure this mysterious virus, but to no avail. So just before the atomic bomb started to drop, there seemed to have been an outbreak of a highly contagious and deadly virus that we only know so little about because right as it started to become a huge issue, the world was cast into nuclear winter. Even more interestingly, if we read all the journal entries regarding the virus in every Fallout game to date, it's discovered that the US government at one point had devoted a large amount of resources to finding a cure to this plague. In the process, they spawned what was called the PVP project, which initially was a study to find a cure that resulted in scientists discovering a way to enhance small animals and rodents, giving them extra strength and intellect, which eventually led into the creation of the FEV or forced evolutionary virus, which we'll talk about more later on this list. However, there may actually be more to this story. You see, in some leaked Van Buren documents, which for those of you that don't know, was the code name for the original Fallout 3 project that was canceled after Bethesda bought the rights to the franchise from the original creators, had some insane lore behind this new plague. In the design docs for this game, it was proposed that the plague was actually originally a genetically engineered bioweapon that the United States had developed for use against China, and that the contagion had broken containment and mutated into what we now see in the game, if only for brief moments. It's interesting to think that the scariest thing in all of Fallout may actually be something that was held back from the atomic bomb drops. Fallout has had its fair share of controversy throughout its tenure as a game franchise. But one of the less well-known and controversial issues revolves around a rejected Fallout 2 perk image for the perk child killer. You see, back in the day, Fallout was a pretty hardcore franchise. In the first two games, you could kill innocent civilians, slaughter children, force droves of crying hostages into slavery, and watch torture unfold before your very eyes. At the time, this resulted in a lot of backlash from even the United States Supreme Court, especially because violent video games were a hot topic issue at the time. But even for these daring developers who put so many mature themes in their game, one symbol had to be cut from the sequel. In Fallout 1 and 2, if you kill multiple children in-game, you get a reputation that stays with you for the rest of the playthrough, that decreases your speech or reaction skills upon first meeting good and evil NPCs, and gives a random chance for bounty hunters to appear on the map trying to take you out for your evil deeds. Originally, the effect was supposed to be represented in-game by this symbol, but for obvious reasons, this was eventually removed from the game as the designers all decided that the iconography had gone way too far. Honestly, nowadays, I think they could probably get away with this as it's more of just a funny illustration. But back in the day, this was not a risk the Fallout devs were willing to take, especially when other similar games were getting canceled entirely in fear of the US government intervening. In Fallout 3, at one point on your quest to get a Gek, a terraforming device created by Future Tech, a division of Vault Tech, you might stumble upon the infamous Vault 87. When first trying to enter the vault, you will notice just outside the location, there are many radiation warning signs, suggesting that this vault was outputting a lot of radiation even before the bombs dropped. And if you actually try to go towards the two entrances of the vault, you will be killed immediately by the immense amount of radiation you immediately are pummeled with. Luckily though, if you make your way back to Lamplight City, a giant underground town full of children who lost their parents after they all tried to go to the surface to get help, you are told about a supposed murder pass that you can cross to get to Vault 87 from the underground. The children of Lamplight had previously explored deeper into the underground cave systems and found the vault, but the inhabitants on the other side said to turn back because they were already doomed. So if you find one of the two ways into the vault, either through a computer terminal or by fighting your way through an army of super mutants guarding the door, you eventually get to the entrance. When you first enter the vault, you are met with a buffet of mutilated bodies and corpses. And if you find one of the terminals at the entrance, you read the story of a man who slowly descends into insanity, watching his children and those around him die. As you make your way further into the vault, you find a host of gore bags used by the super mutants to serve other humans as food. And you find more terminals that express that many people in the vault had no idea what was actually going on at the time, 
and were confused. Journal entries note that there were many power surges, weird experiments, and strange sounds many of the early residents complained about. And you eventually even find a terminal entry that notes 93 people have died in the vault, with 83 being listed under a strange and mysterious, unidentifiable death condition. If you manage to make your way even deeper into this twisted vault, you are met with multiple bloody handprints, scenes of horror, and finally, a room where you can find multiple testing chambers full of dead, early generation super mutants. The scientists in the vault were experimenting on the human inhabitants by dousing them with high amounts of FEV radiation, also known as the Force Evolutionary Virus, which was the virus spawned out of developing a cure for the new plague. These deadly doses had transformed many of the inhabitants into absolute monstrosities known as super mutants, the first generation of their kind, with many having busted limbs, small lower bodies and massive upper bodies, and other weird disfigurements. You discover that there was something known as EEP testing going on here, otherwise known as the Evolutionary Experimentation Program and that the male and female test subjects were being exposed to insanely high amounts of FEV radiation in order to study the effects, which turned most of the vault dwellers into asexual and imperfect super mutants. Eventually, these super mutants became enraged at the horrible testing they had undergone and led an assault against the vault, killing the remaining members. And it can even be discovered at the end of the vault that the FEV radiation we discovered outside was actually done on purpose by vault Tech to test the effects of FEV on nearby surrounding towns as well. A truly unbelievable experiment that truly went too far. In our real world, the dangers of lead are now more than apparent, but in Fallout, things may not have been as safe. You see, things like lead paint and lead in children's toys has been banned for years now in our timeline due to the discovery that lead is actually very, very toxic to human beings and can cause many neurological problems which are said to be one of the main causes for the elevated crime rate in the 60s to the 90s, with many people exhibiting signs of increased aggression and murder in that period. But in Fallout, lead was never actually banned in the same way. In fact, for any players, paying especially close attention, they may notice that the majority of lead they get from crafting in Fallout 4 actually comes from breaking down children's toys you find throughout the world. This suggests that many of the citizens in Fallout may actually suffer from severe lead poisoning, which would explain the irrational behavior we see from so many that also led the leaders of the world to sending us into all-out war. Could it be that the secret killer of Fallout is actually the insane amounts of lead poisoning going on in the populace? Between that and the radiation, it's hard to tell. For those that found themselves in Vault 11 after the Great War, life would have been good. That is until the Overseer announced the rules of the Vault. Every year, one person inside would have to be sacrificed in order to appease the mainframe. Otherwise, all would perish in an instant. This initial announcement was met with huge uproar, and all citizens of the vault banded together and voted for the overseer to be used as the first sacrifice. He resisted at first, but the residents were able to guess his password to his computer, controlling the death chamber as his wife's name, and he was sentenced to death. He walked his way down a short hallway and was met with a small room that held nothing but a projector and a single seat, and it was here he met his final demise. After this incident, it was decided that each year a new overseer for the vault would be voted in by all residents and later sacrificed to appease the mainframe. But this resulted in many of the vault dwellers banding together and creating blocks. That way they could team up and decide who would be chosen next. Every year, particularly hated individuals from each block would give speeches on why they should not be chosen as the next overseer, with many using their loving families and children as a way to guilt others into not choosing them. The strongest of these groups was referred to as the Justice Block, and in one year a man named Nathan from a separate block had beaten many of the Justice Block members in poker, which very much angered them. And because of the power they held in the vault, it became apparent that Nathan was most likely going to be voted as the next overseer and die. In order to save her husband, Nathan's wife Catherine decided to meet with the Justice Block and ask for forgiveness, but they told her the only way they would forgive is if they were all to have their way with her. And so they did for months on end, until it eventually became clear that even after Catherine's sacrifice, 
Nathan was still going to be voted as the next overseer. In retaliation, Catherine went on a murdering spree of multiple members of the Justice Block, and because of this was swiftly voted by all vault dwellers as the next overseer. Now with complete control of the vault, Catherine decided to change the rules of the simulation instead opting to choose a random person each year to death to appease the mainframe, rather than leaving it to a vote. The Justice Block began to go into turmoil over the idea they may lose power, with some members arguing they just needed to wait until one of the members got the overseer job to change the rules, but it was too late and a brawl broke out between the Justice League and other vault dwellers. Now with the majority of the citizens left dead, the remaining members vowed to never again sacrifice anyone to the mainframe, and instead all band together and die as one. But when the time finally came that the next sacrifice had to happen, the mainframe simply congratulated the survivors on using human decency and finally solving the puzzle of the vault. The mainframe opened the door to the vault and wished the dwellers the best of luck. Pure guilt and dismay overcame the remaining survivors, and they all decided to create a death pact where they all killed one another, except for one survivor, who walked out of the vault knowing every detail of the horrors that had transpired. To this day, we still do not know who that lone survivor is. Some speculate it is Nobark from Fallout New Vegas, but we will never know, and that one person may have some of the most twisted trauma in the entire series. Fallout 4 players know just how annoying the gunners and their entire faction can be at times, routinely attacking your settlements and being more of a nuisance than anything. One of the most strange things about them though is we actually have no idea where they stem from. They just kind of are here. One theory postulates though that the gunners may in fact be remnants of the famous Vault 75, located under Molden Middle School. Set up specifically for children, the vault was supposed to be a place to protect and preserve the youth, but in classic vault tech fashion, it was being used for a much more nefarious purpose. The children inside were being experimented on endlessly, and the scientists in the vault would destroy any child that did not perform at the utmost highest levels on each test of strength, dexterity, and intellect. This eventually resulted in an army of super soldier children that retaliated against the scientists and escaped the vault, never to be seen again. But could the militaristic and strong gunner faction actually be these children now all grown up? One of the most twisted, horrifying, and unknown backstories in all of the Fallout universe is the story behind the drilling company, the Dunwich Borers. A play on the words referencing the Lovecraftian monster story, The Dunwich Horrors. The company produces a multitude of different rock tunneling drills that they sell off to different companies for use in drilling into the Earth's crust, and we encounter the Dunwich establishment in multiple of the games. In Fallout 4 specifically, we stumble upon the corporate entity in a giant quarry mine, where for some reason they are using their own company drills to make their own quarry. Something that they shouldn't be doing in theory, as they are just lending out equipment on their books. As you make your way down into the quarry, you read many terminal reports that the workers are complaining about constant power outages going on and off, as well as rocks being thrown from seemingly out of nowhere and taking out people's eyes. On each of the terminals, you can also see that all the Dunwich Quarry station managers are being called to the deepest station, Station 4, immediately. So you descend even deeper into this creepy underground dig site, and on your way you find many other terminal entries, detailing many strange things happening in the quarry, with the most damning of all being an entry that we simply find that is screaming over and over again, I'm safe in the light. I'm safe in the light. By the time you make your way to Station 3, you must descend deep underground, and it is here where you are met with hordes of feral ghouls all attacking you on sight, as well as light switches that mysteriously turn themselves on and off. Suddenly, you start to see weird visions of a cult-like ritual taking place, with a man with a knife in the center of an altar, surrounded by many others kneeling before him in a circle. And as these visions fade in and out, you finally make your way to the end of the quarry, Station 4. You find nothing but a pool of water and a missing crane, and if you leap into the water yourself, you can find not only some sweet loot, but the remains of that altar room you saw in the visions before. On top of this, you can find a half-excavated statue that points to the real reason the Dunwich Borers Company was here. 
They were excavating some sort of ancient statue that belonged to a long-lost civilization that was a cult of worshippers that prayed to an evil deity known as Ukultov. We know of this deity from previous games, like Fallout 3 as well, as in this game we are able to actually explore the Dunwich Boar's headquarters, which at the time we explore is in a run-down and vacant state, except for the feral ghouls on site. You learn in Fallout 3 that the Dunwich Boars were trying to unearth and communicate with this long lost deity, and that they have unearthed some ancient relics that were seemingly turning people into feral ghouls through sacrifice. This begs the question as to whether all ghouls are actually being created through radiation poisoning, or if something much more sinister is at play. On top of this, the swamp people of Fallout 3 were also shown to be worshipping this same deity. And it also shows just how weird and mysterious the Dunwich Boars really are, as they seemingly are using their company as a front, with many of the employees not even knowing their true motives, in order to summon an ancient god back to Earth. One of the most out there and interesting entities in all of Fallout. While we do get to explore some of the most disturbing vaults in all of Fallout in the games, some have so far only been left to players' imaginations and two of the most unbelievable of these are Vault 68 and Vault 69. Each of the vaults was performing the same experiment but reversed. In Vault 68, they were staffed with 999 men and one woman. In Vault 69, they were staffed with 999 women and one man. Each of these experiments was to see what would happen when only one of each sex was left with hundreds of the opposing. While little is known about what actually happened in these vaults, we can pick up on small tidbits we see in comments or cancelled projects or just our own imagination to paint a brutal scene. In Vault 68, the one full of men and one woman, it is theorized that the men started to fight amongst one another, resulting in a bloody mess, where only the most dominant of each tribe were able to have their way with the one unlucky female. Population growth would have been exceptionally slow, and any baby that the female had that was male was instantly killed off, slowly leading to the death of the entire vault as the female withered away. In Vault 69, however, where only one man was tasked with repopulating with 999 females, not much is known either. But it can be assumed that early on, the man would have been living out what many males would consider a fantasy, only to realize he had no male friends to confide in, slowly going insane after impregnating and repopulating much of the vault. The females, on the other hand, would have lived a mostly amazing life, free from our bullshit. <laughs> Back when I was a kid, I vaguely remembered a Fallout 3 story that at the time scared me so bad it made me not want to even play the game at all. That original story was a creepypasta horror deep dive that claimed that Fallout 3 Galaxy News Radio, under certain conditions, would unravel into something truly unbelievable. The creepypasta and subsequent posts theorized that if 3Dog, the radio station owner and host, were killed, something that could actually happen in Fallout 3, along with some other small conditions, that the station would transform into a number station. For those that don't know, number stations were a real thing in the United States and other countries that were rumored to be part of a nuclear retaliation control network. Tuning into their frequencies, people were able to pick up on strange coded messages being read in a monotone voice from an apparent government official reading single digit numbers one by one. In this creepypasta though, it is claimed once Galaxy News Radio becomes a number station, you could hear the voice of 3Dog, now dead, slowly and eerily reading off numbers, just like this. Followed by the song, set the world on fire. Where this started to get really crazy is that some members of the community apparently began decoding some of these weird messages coming from the number station and translated them into dates and phrases. Some of these phrases spoke about the queen's death, future Armageddon, and most weirdly, all of them seemed to be about our timeline, not the actual Fallout universe. And so the most dedicated in the community were then able to translate even more of the codes into dates, which correlated with the deaths of many important people, including Lincoln and Gary Coleman. And most frightening of all, 
Some of the dates correlated to supposed massive events of the future that signaled death, like the dates for the coronavirus outbreak. Many of these threads were taken down as the story started to get out of hand and caused genuine concern amongst players starting to believe they were real. And the story gets even crazier, as it's been proven that there are some actual weird Morse code messages found in Fallout 3's code base that could relate to these number stations. But it's likely that Bethesda simply patched in some weird radio chatter as a funny easter egg for the players after the fact. That, or one of the most beloved games of all time, is actually a secret government and Illuminati front to warn us about our impending doom through predicting the future. I'm not high, I swear. In Fallout 3, there's a particularly well-hidden and unmarked quest called Our Little Secret that many people don't know about. It tells the story of the town of Andale, where the player character is told explicitly to stay away from. In the town, you're able to find a garden shed that leads to the entrance of the basement of the Smith's house, some of the local Andale residents. And it's here that you find a horrific scene, with multiple mutilated bodies cut up and displayed on cooking tables and racks. It's immediately clear to the player that this town is actually hiding a dark secret, and has been kidnapping local travelers and using their bodies to create a variety of dishes. If you confront the cannibals head on, they will attack you on sight, but if you actually have the cannibal perk, you have a chance to sweet talk them and join amongst their ranks. It's crazy to think that with all the horrors happening inside the vaults, it might be even scarier living outside them. After stepping into a variety of vaults in Fallout, it quickly becomes apparent that these underground lairs were host to some of the most dark and abhorrent tests in humanity's history. But one specific vault may have the most twisted experiment of them all. It's a vault that doesn't make any official appearances in the games, but it is canon based on one comic referencing it. It tells the story of one man, who is tricked into entering the vault on his own, after which the door is quickly shut behind him. He pleads and screams to be let out, but no one answers his call. For months he keeps himself alive every day praying that someone will find and rescue him, or that this sick experiment will finally come to an end. But this waiting game goes on for over a year as this poor soul is slowly starting to lose his mind and see things. But just as he is about to lose all hope, he discovers a giant box of puppets. He starts to enact different plays and scenes with them, and it gives him a jolt of energy and excitement to finally again have new friends. These scenes slowly become more and more crazy though, and he starts to associate life with the puppets hearing them speaking to him as he descends deeper and deeper into madness. So deep into his own delusion, the man develops split personality disorder and begins to communicate through each personality with multiple puppets. And it is around this time that we discover that the vault has actually been open this whole time. The man was merely too afraid to leave on account of the bombs outside. But with his newfound personalities, he gathers the courage and escapes the vault meeting multiple ghouls, raiders, and wildlife. One of the raider groups he meets grows suspicious and scared of the man though, worried he is actually very violent and dangerous. And well, this turns out to be true, as a puppet tells the man to kill, and he does, slaughtering all the raiders and their families, showing that the vault was not protecting this man from the dangers outside, but that the vault was protecting outside from the dangers of this man. As to whether we will ever meet this sadistic human being in a future Fallout entry, we'll just have to wait and find out. The Mysterious Stranger is a character we have seen in almost every Fallout game, from the original Interplay top-down games to the more recent Bethesda entries. But as to who this mysterious man is, no one really knows. He shows up out of nowhere in each of the games and one-shots your foes, helping the player make their way through the main quest and objectives. And just as quickly as he appears, he disappears in a flash. We know Nick Valentine in Fallout 4 was researching this stranger, but he didn't find anything big on him, simply commenting whenever he shows up. More damning evidence comes from Fallout New Vegas, where we can meet a man called the Lone Wanderer, who talks about how his mother described his father as a mysterious man who he never met. He plays the guitar, and most crazy, if speech checks are passed, will give you a gun that when holstered and unholstered, plays the exact same guitar riff that we hear when the mysterious stranger appears. 
On top of this, the gun model is the exact same gun model that the mysterious stranger uses on their gun. The only problem with this revelation is that it still doesn't explain how this stranger appears in all the games that are set hundreds of years apart. Could it be that he has stumbled upon some power similar to the Cabot family that has given him immortality and the ability to teleport and have super strength? And if this is the case, why is this man even following our player character in every game? Does this mean that all the main characters from each Fallout game are somehow connected? Could some sort of deity be in place that is using the mysterious stranger as a vessel to guide you on your path? The possibilities are honestly endless and spawn even more questions than they answer. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. The recent support of my videos has been crazy. I've literally gotten more views in the past week than I have in the past decade, and it's awesome to see all the love and support. So let me know down below what icebergs you guys want to see next. And if you enjoyed this video, make sure to check out the live streams I do too every single weekend, or go check out some of my other channels where I do daily uploads and clips from some of the content here. Or if you want to support me even more, definitely check out the YouTube membership program we now have if you guys want to offer a little financial help, that way I can eventually get an editor and produce more content for you guys. As always, until next time.